Amen. I certainly appreciate Pastor Joel and his friendship over the years. And uh, I think the first time I met Pastor Joel was uh, in, in Geneseo. And my dad was preaching for your dad. And, um, and so uh, now I guess kind of reminiscing over that, we went uh, to a pizza place that had a bowling alley attached to it. Do you remember that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, he even knows the name. And uh, I guess he lived there. I didn't. But, um, but I remember uh, we ate the pizza, and I thought, man, this pizza is no good. But at least there's bowling afterwards. And I was like, we got to go bowling afterwards. And then as we were leaving, no one was, was going bowling. And, uh, and I asked Dad, I said, we, are, we're not going bowling? He's like, no, we're not going bowling. And uh, it was there I realized bowling is not a man's, a man's activity. That's a child's thing, I guess. But anyways... I still like to bowl. I'm no good at it. My dad would never take me, obviously, but uh, no, I, I'm just joking. But it's good to be here this morning and uh, excited to be uh, here uh, in Davenport and um, excited about what God's doing here at Cross Point and certainly a blessing to be with you today. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning in chapter number 15. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 15. And uh, I joked that uh, uh, the, the first service got the edited version, you know, uh, because, you know, press for time and things like that. But I don't know. Uh, I think I just spoke faster or something. I was looking. And so uh, you'll get maybe the less rushed uh, Eric and th this morning. So uh, maybe uh, I'll be more mindful of what I'm actually saying. I just felt like I was, you know, like when you listen to a book and you turn it up to times two, that's what I felt like I was on on uh, this morning's service. So. Uh, anyways, this is for the all non times two listeners in the room. All right. So anyways, Luke chapter 15, we're just going to read the first few verses, uh, by way to, uh, launch us into this text. Uh, but we're, we will look at, uh, uh, every verse here in Luke 15 this morning and, uh, uh, such a dynamic passage in, in scripture. But look at verse number one, then drew near unto him, the him here is Jesus, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying. So what's happening here in Luke chapter 15 is Jesus is hosting a dinner party. And he's invited four groups of people to the party. He's invited the publicans and the sinners and the Pharisees and the scribes. And the first two groups are polar opposite than the second two groups. And uh, just to kind of explain this in their culture, uh, the, the publican would have been like their version of the tax collector. But to uh, kind of equate him to the IRS agent would be maybe... Uh, not quite do it justice. Uh, we, we don't typically like the IRS, but we're not like enemies with them, you know. Uh, uh, in this day, the, the pu uh, publican was a, a Jewish citizen who had gone to work for Rome. And so he had gone to work for the oppressor, and he basically had become, uh, well, an outcast. He was not invited into synagogue. He was not welcome to any of the family dinners or the feasts and festivals. He would have not been welcomed uh, even to family uh, Sabbath. He would have been completely excommunicated from, from his family and his community as someone who is not walking the way of the text. And then, uh, and then you've got the, uh, the, the sinners, right? And we hear this word sinner. We've got a bunch of uh, connotations that we have built up in our mind of what a sinner is or isn't. But in their day, really, when, when Luke is using it, uh, he's, he's talking about those that were notorious for their sin. Those that when you looked at their life, you looked at uh, who they were or how they were dressed or what they were doing, uh, there was no hiding it. It was out there in the open. They were notorious sinners. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of a better place for these two groups of people to be, the public sinners, than where we find them in verse number one of Luke 15. Because uh, here they are, these publicans and the sinners, and they're drawing near unto Jesus for to hear him. And I think one thing that Luke is building throughout the entire gospel here is the power of, of the words of Jesus. That his words have power, and the power is to change lives, right? Like, he commands the winds and the water to stand still, and they stand still. He commands the demons to flee, and they flee, right? He truly is greater, and now you have this, this image of the publicans and the sinners, and they've drawn near to Jesus to hear him. Like, their, their reputation might be publicans and sinners, but these are people who have sat under the words of Jesus, who have, who have been drawn to him, okay? But they're, they're not the only people invited to the party. 
the publicans and the sinners, and then the Pharisees and the scribes. So polar opposite group, you got the Pharisees and scribes. And these are kind of like the religious astute, the religious elite of their day. Uh, they weren't necessarily, the, the Pharisees weren't necessarily the pastors of their churches and synagogues, but they were heavily involved. And really the, the, the word uh, ph Pharisee is a transliteration from the word parashim, uh, meaning separated ones from Persia. And so it was a group that had come out of the Babylon captivity, and they were determined to live different than that of the Persian Empire. They were determined to live differently because they were going to be dedicated to the text. They were going to be dedicated to their Torah, to the law, and to the prophets. And so because they were so dedicated to it, they actually made up a bunch of other laws, like a fence around the law, so that you wouldn't break that law. And so if anyone broke and, or hopped over the fence, they were excommunicated. You know, you're out. No more welcomed. And so it was this, uh, this, 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 this uh, mission of purity that had really become uh, a cold-hearted and, and cruel towards the others around them. And uh, that's the Pharisees. And then you've got the scribes. And the scribes were the, um, well, I guess they would be more like the teachers of the law. They were very educated people. They could read, they could write, and they were those that would interpret the law. And so uh, reading was not a top priority in that day. Uh, writing certainly was not a top priority in a Jewish mindset, but for a scribe, he had the education, and he was the one that would uh, write out the law, and he would he would then he would he would scribble it out, and then he would come and he would interpret that, and basically his interpretation came to be uh, set in stone. Uh, if you look at things that are post Bible, like the uh, Midrash, and things that are like uh, even even more post Bible, like the Sanhedrin and the, and all the other stuff, like the, the Talmud that set up Judaism essentially. Uh, man, and the scribal, uh, the scribal interpretations were even more important. They were weightier than the law itself. And so that's why Jesus has a beef with them, because Jesus comes and he says, well, you've heard it said this way, but I say unto you this, right? This is what the scribes have told you, but this is the actual interpretation from God himself. And so they're going to they're gonna butt heads. But they've been invited to the, the dinner party as well. And as, as they get to the dinner party, they look inside and they notice who else made the guest list, right? Like they see the publicans and the sinners are there. And so they start murmuring and complaining. Like, how can this man claim he be from God and yet sit and dine with these publicans and sinners? These are the very reasons that Messiah has not come and that he will not come because there's publicans and sinners. And so they're disgusted. They start murmuring amongst each other. They are complaining. And Jesus hears their murmuring and complaining and he answers their criticism with a parable. He speaks a parable unto them. Now, a parable is an earthly story that has heavenly meaning. Uh, it, it brought a heavenly perspective to an earthly situation. And Jesus loves parables. He speaks a lot of them in the New Testament. In fact, in Matthew 13, it says that he went for a season of his ministry only speaking in parables. But something special happens around dinner that night in Luke 15. Because like in Luke 15, Jesus lays out one of his greatest hits, you know, like if you were compiling a record, you know, and you're like, Jesus and the parables, the greatest hits edition, you know. Uh, Luke 15 has got to be track number one. Like, it's, it's, it's this beautiful, dynamic parable that we just completely miss. Like, I mean, we don't completely miss it. We understand it, but something happens in Luke 15 that is just beautiful. And he's going he's gonna to use three stories here to communicate one truth. And that's why I call it a parable, not parables. Because what Jesus is going to do here is he's going to use these three stories to communicate one pointed truth to these Pharisees and scribes and really to all who would listen. And these three stories are going to be weaved together in a way that uh, maybe we don't understand. So, so the emphasis here, the emotion that Jesus is playing with is this idea of losing and finding the heartbreak of what it feels like to lose and then the, the the sweet joy and relief and what it feels like to find and and so so he's going to use this this parable about lost sheep and lost coins and lost sons but his emphasis is not on the objects that are lost right so so we we look at it and we we talk about the lost sheep and the lost coins and the lost sons but when jesus is telling it his focus is on the one who does the finding right so he's actually telling a story about shepherds, about women, and about a father who are searching and pursuing after lost sheep, 
lost coins and lost sons. And I think that has more, more power behind it for a couple of reasons. Um, well, my, my son, Mason, he, he's six now, but when he was four, he had just turned four, and uh, he had gotten a, a bicycle for his birthday, and, uh, and he liked to go out, and he would pretend that he could go out on his own. You know, when you're four, you've, you've learned everything you need to know from dad, so you can just, you know, do whatever you want. And so, uh, so we had constantly remind him, like, no, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta tell us you're going outside, you know. And, and one night, I was upstairs, and I was kind of putting our service online, you know, because all of our services were live-streamed, you know, and live stream only back in those days. And so I'm trying to push the service out live. And, and after the service was done, I, I came downstairs, and I was excited to just kind of play with my kids after dinner, you know. And I picked up Logan, who I think was like one at the time, you know, and I'm picking him up, and, uh, or maybe it was two, and I'm, I'm holding him and having a good time with him. And I'm like, all right, where's Mason, you know, where's Mason? My wife's like, well, I think he's upstairs. Oh, he's upstairs. I was just upstairs. I didn't see him up there, you know, and so I put Logan down. I go upstairs, and I start looking for him, you know. You know how kids play hide and seek, you know. They're no good at, at hiding, but you pretend that you're seeking, you know, but, but on that night, I was like, my kid has mastered this game. I can't find him. Like, where is he? He's not behind the curtain. He's not under the desk. He's not under the bed. Like, I'm going into my room. I'm going, I'm looking everywhere upstairs. I'm, I'm opening closets. I'm looking up in shelves, looking at places I would hide, you know, and, and, uh, and so I come downstairs, and I said, Lexa, I don't think he's upstairs. Are you sure he's upstairs? And my wife gives me the look that only wives can give, you know. She's like, of course he's upstairs, you know, and she starts marching up there as if to prove me wrong, you know. I'm like, well, I know he's not up there. So I start looking downstairs. You know, I start looking in the cabinets downstairs. And where is he? He's got to be in here somewhere. And, and after I do some searching, you know, I can't find him. And my wife comes downstairs and she's whiter than I am. You know, that's not a good sign, you know. And uh, I said, what's wrong? And she's like, he's not up there. I was like, I know he's not up there, you know. You lost him, you know. <laughs> and uh, where could he be, you know. And so we start calling his name. We're like, all right, Mason, you won. All right, you're the best hider in the house. Come on out, buddy. Mason, come on out, all right? We don't know where you're at. Come on out. Mason Paul, you better come out of your hiding spot right now. <sighs> he's, not, he's not listening. That's his, that's his problem. He doesn't listen. And so I opened that front door, and I thought, well, maybe he rode his bike. And I looked at his front door. I was like, his bike is there. I look out the back door. He's not in our little back porch area. And so I'm opening that door. The, the sun is setting. It's getting dark, you know. And, and uh, Arizona doesn't observe time change, so it was still a little bit light, you know. But it, but it, was, it was getting dark, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking... I don't know where he's at, like, and I don't know even how to begin the search process. Like, do you call the police? Uh, all I can think about were all the pictures of the lost kids at Walmart, you know, and all the terrible parents that they have. And I'm like, now I'm one of those terrible parents, you know, I'm like, this is not good, you know. And uh, I'm like, what do you even do? So we start walking around all of the, the, the neighborhood, you know, we're walking around our little condo plex and I'm shouting his name, Mason, Mason, you know, and my wife, like my, my kid doesn't know a stranger, you know, he doesn't know strangers. Partially that's my fault. They take him to a bunch of different churches and say, go meet the strangers, you know? And so uh, he doesn't know strangers. And so I'm like, uh, you know, he could, he could have jumped in a van with anybody at this point, you know? And so I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm on the verge of, of weeping. I've got the weight of this world on my shoulder. Like all the haters were right. I'm a terrible person who should have never had kids, you know? And I remember coming back in that house, sitting down on that couch and looking at Logan and being like, well, one for two ain't bad, I guess, you know? And like, just, like, this is not good. And as we're sitting there, my wife, who's, who's I think, weeping as well, she, she looks up and, and she sees in the corner of that living room this um, uh, uh, Fisher Price picnic table thing that, that my mother-in-law had bought my kids for, like, a birthday, Christmas, a random Tuesday, you know, whatever it was. She got it for them, and it had this blanket over it, you know, and it was where our basket of blankets normally was. And so uh, I, she, said, uh, she said, what's that? Did, did you check that? And I said, he better not be under there. Because if he's under there, he's in big trouble, you know. I mean, I've been shouting his name for the past hour, you know. And I go and I lift up that blanket. And I see Mason sound asleep under that table. <laughs> oh, man, I, I removed that picnic table. I just felt the weight of the world off of my shoulders. And I just, I just melted to the floor. Just wrapped my arms around him. I just picked him up and carried him to his bed. He didn't wake up. You know, he didn't, didn't wake up. I put him down in that bed. I lay next to him, slept there the rest of that night. Why? Because I had experienced what it felt like to lose. And then I had, I had experienced that joy and that relief and what it felt like to find. And that's the story Jesus is communicating here. 
He's talking about what, what it feels like to lose and what it feels like to find. And what he's doing here is he's weaving together these, these stories that, that, that would have connected in the mind of the Pharisee and scribe. So in their Bible, they have a psalm section, right? The, the psalms, it was their hymn book. It's the songs they sung and praised God, their Lord Adonai, right? But in that psalm section, God shows up metaphorically all over the place. He shows up as like a strong tower and a mighty fortress and a strong wind. We don't typically talk like about that about God today. We prefer terms and definitions, right? Like God is loving and God is powerful and God is strong. And we'll even use even theological terms like he's omnipotent, right? Well, that's not a Bible word. That's a theology term that, uh, that, that's describing the same thing that the, the psalms are, just in a different way, a different means of doing it. They prefer pictures and images. We prefer terms and definitions. And in the Psalms section of their Bible, God shows up as a physical person, like an animate, metaphorically, as like a physical person in the flesh, uh, only three different ways. He shows up as a, a shepherd in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lay down in green pastures beside still waters, right? Like he's the shepherd. He shows up in Psalms 103 as a father who has compassion upon his children. So doth the Lord have compassion on all those who fear him. And then he shows up in Psalms 131 as a mother who nurses her distressed child to rest. And so in their, in their psalm book, they have these, these, these allegories of God as a shepherd, as a woman, as a father. And all three of those are allegories and pictures that represent God's gentleness and compassion towards other people. That our God is gentle and compassionate. And it's almost as if Jesus, as he tells this story, is looking out at the Pharisees and scribes and he's saying, listen, you know so much about God. You, 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 you claim to be so dedicated to the text. You have all these rules and all these laws to keep you pure, but you're missing something about your God. You, you, you've missed out on his gentleness and compassion towards all people, including the publicans and the sinners. And so, so like we look at the story and we're like, man, this is beautiful. But notice Jesus is using the story as like a boxing match with the, with the, with the, with the Pharisees and scribes. This is a knockout fight that he is going to win in three rounds flat, okay? And so I want to look at it. We've, we've, done, it, we've done a lot of background. Now look at verse number three, uh, four. He says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Now notice all the emphasis is put on the shepherd here, that he's lost it. He's gone to find it. And when he hath found it, in verse 5, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance." So Jesus starts by asking a question about shepherds and flocks. And he says, if you were a shepherd uh, and you lost one of your sheep, would you not go out and find that sheep? And there, there's an obvious answer there. If you're a shepherd, the answer is yes. Yeah, like if, if my job is to take care of my sheep. If I lost one, I should probably go find it, right? If I don't go find my sheep, that would mean that I am a bad shepherd, not a very good shepherd. Shepherd. So it's an obvious answer. Everything Jesus talks about is exactly what a shepherd in that day would have done. He would have gone, he would have found it. When he finds it, he wouldn't necessarily rebuke it. He would put it on its shoulders. He would carry it back. And when he got back, he would have a feast. And they would invite friends to come to celebrate the finding of this sheep. Okay, so, so this is all, yes, a resounding, absolutely, that's what we would do. So why is Jesus asking this obvious question? Well, because in the Old Testament again, remember, He's talking to people who know the text, who think the text, who breathe the text. In the Old Testament, Jesus, the Lord uses his prophets to condemn their, the leaders of Israel as bad shepherds. He, he talks about them as terrible shepherds. And we have to think, like, go, go to Ezekiel 34. Hold your place there in Luke 15, but go back to Ezekiel 34. Um, because, because, like, like they understood the reference. Like, they, they pick up what Jesus is putting down here. Um, 
Like when we come to church today, we, we typically got one thing on our mind, right? Like what, what's for lunch, you know? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we, have, we have on our mind, uh, what does this have to do with me, right? Like, uh, is this applicable to me? Is the message going to be relevant to me, right? That, that's kind of, we're very me, me focused when we come to church. But people in this day, when they came and heard teachers and rabbis and all that stuff teach, they weren't necessarily thinking about them. They were thinking about the text, that, that they knew the text, and so they wanted to, to know what, what, what does this have to do with the text, okay? So, like, it, it'd just be like today, if I came in and said, Luke, I am your father, you'd be like, yeah, I, I understood that reference, right? Like, I've seen that, that's from Star Trek, you know? Just kidding, that was, that was a joke. Star Wars, I got it. Okay, so my point proven, right? Okay, like, we understand the reference that, that has been made. Right? We got Captain Kirk with his lightsaber talking to his son Luke. And so what, what we have here is this, this reference that Jesus is doing. It's a hyperlink, if you want to think about it that way, that links all the way back to their, their, their literature, their, their prophets about the Old Testament. And so, and so when, when, when Jesus starts talking about shepherds, they start thinking about shepherds in their texts. And I think they come to Ezekiel 34 pretty quickly, and they, they see, And the word of the Lord, verse number one, came unto, uh, unto me, saying, Son of man, heard Jesus use that one before. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered, because there is no shepherd." And they became meat unto all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. And none did search or seek after them. Well, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, Jesus is using this prophecy, this, this prophetic word from Ezekiel as, as, as his background. He's saying, listen, yeah, yeah, that's what a shepherd should do, but bad shepherds don't do that. And so I am here to be the good shepherd, right? I am the good shepherd. Now, in Ezekiel 34, look at verse number 11, because, because eventually God himself shows up. And it says in verse number 11, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. In other words, what, what Ezekiel is saying is, listen, if the shepherds of Israel don't start doing what they're supposed to do, if they don't start acting like they're supposed to act, well, then God says, I'll have no other choice but to show up myself because my heart is to find the lost sheep. My heart is not that they'd be scattered, but they would, they would be brought into the fold. There would be celebration over the sheep returning home. And so now Jesus is saying, you want to sit outside and you want to murmur and you want to complain. Well, guess what? I'm here. Well, the reason I'm eating with the publicans and sinners is because you're not doing your job. You didn't go find the sheep. You let them be scattered. You didn't care that they were scattered. You didn't care what hill they were on. And so he says, so I have come. Jesus is saying, I am he that said he would come to both search the sheep and find the sheep. In other words, he's saying, I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. I am here to seek and to save that which was lost. And so, so the, the publicans and sinners are like, man, what a beautiful story. This is exactly what he did for us. And the Pharisees and scribes, well, they're getting uncomfortable in their pew, you know, like, I, th I think he's talking about us. I mean, I wanted him to talk about the text, but he's talking about the text and he's talking about us. This isn't good. And he's not done. Round two, okay? Round two, talk about beating them when they're down. Look at verse number uh, six of, uh, of uh, Luke 15. Uh, sorry, verse eight. He asked another question. He says, either what woman, having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner 
that repented. Okay, so he's asking a second question. The first one had an obvious answer. This one probably going to have an obvious answer too. So let's see if it, if it works out in, in, our, in our context. We've got uh, this, uh, this woman who has 10 pieces of silver and she's getting out of her car one night. Like, let's just put it in our terms. Like, if you were a woman and you got out of your car and you dropped your purse and some of your coins fell out and went into the cracks and been underneath the seat, would you not go into your house, get your wrench and get your jack and get your flashlight and wouldn't you go and take that seat out because you got to tear it out and you got to shine the light in to grab those four quarters like what what, what don't you do that no 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 no. it's a it's it's only 75 cents it wasn't that big of a deal right okay so something's got to be going on here because jesus is, is telling it like it's it's obvious answers yes she would do this right so so either this coin these coins are a lot more valuable than a 25 cents or they have no value at all and they mean something very different. Because like I've always wondered, like if it was about the money, if this woman's like, I got to find that 10th coin because that, that, that's, I need the money. Why then does after she find it, does she have a huge party where she invites the whole neighborhood where she spends money to have a party? Like, wouldn't it have been better just not to have the party and just be like, okay, well, I guess I won't have a party today. You know, like, no, uh, if you're going to find the coin and immediately spend it, it doesn't seem like it was about the value of the coin. And I think that's where our answer is. These coins were not just valuable, they were priceless. Now, Warren Wearsby is going to help us with this in his commentary on the book of Luke. He's going to talk about how these 10 coins referenced together, these 10 pieces of silver, are most likely a, a, a headpiece that a married woman would wear in the day that was given to her by the patriarch of her new family. That, that, that as part of the betrothal process, it would have been given to her to simplify or, or to, as a symbol of her coming into a new family. That she now has a new identity. She is now being welcomed welcomed into a new family. And, and Warren goes on to say that, that the, these coins were so precious and so priceless that even if this woman was in a great amount of debt and like they were taking her cattle and her house and they were being, you can picture it, like she's declared bankruptcy, they're stripping everything away. The one thing that they couldn't take from her was those coins. Because those coins wasn't value, it was identity. It wasn't just what she had, it was who she was, Okay. So, so, in other words, like, now all of a sudden it makes sense why she's got to find this coin. Because Warren Wearsby goes on to say that if she would have lost one of these coins, well, it would have been grounds for divorce. And even more so, it would have been grounds for death. Now, I think that's a little extreme, okay? Because, uh, well, I'm kind of getting the picture here that this is their version of a wedding ring, right? You know, and uh, I'm not wearing the wedding ring I got at my wedding. This one's made out of rubber. And there's a reason for that, because the one I did get at my wedding is in the bottom of a lake in Wisconsin. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite embarrassed to tell you about that. Honestly, we were wakeboarding and uh, my hands were getting calloused and uh, I don't like that. And so I, I went to take my ring off and as I took it, I came off and uh, it, it, yeah, it, it was gone. But not once during that whole process, although I was embarrassed, not once was I like, oh no. When I get home, Lex is going to send me to the gallows. You know, like, this is not good. My life is over. Like, not, not once was that on my mind. It wasn't like a, a loss of life. Why? Because we understand this is a symbol of my marriage, not an actual, uh, doesn't make me married, right? Like, that's something else, right? But in their culture, it was, it was symbolic of loyalty to your husband. You weren't allowed to take it off unless you're in the presence of your husband. And so if, if you did, they, they would have thought, well, man, she must be unfaithful, or maybe she uh, was uh, uh, having a, you know, an affair. And so they would, they would put her to death. Now, this is very drastic and very uh, no, uh, out of the ordinary, but then doesn't it make the story make sense? Like she is, of course, she's going to sweep the floor. Of course, she's going to uh, light the, the, uh, the, the, the room. Of course, she's going to do whatever she can. Of course, she's going to crouch down and look everywhere she can to find that coin. Why? Well, her life is on the line. Her reputation is on the line. Her marriage is on the line. Like, she's got to find that coin. And once she finds it, doesn't it make sense that she throws a party? Of course, she, she's going to spend no matter what, what, what amount of money to celebrate the fact that, that she's still going to be married and that she still has life. Like, this is a huge deal. And again, to the people listening, it's beautiful. But to the Pharisees and scribes, Jesus is making another strong point against them. He's saying you have lost a part of what makes you the family of God. 
These publicans and sinners, they are your brothers. They are your sisters. They are part of your heritage. They, They are Jews as well. They're chosen by God. And yet you have abandoned them. You have forsaken them. You have lost them. And you don't light their way to usher them back in. You could care less that they're gone. In fact, you wish that they would be gone even further. He says that is not in the heart of God. The heart of God is one who lights the path, who searches to the depths, who looks and pursues longingly after every part of the family of God. All right, so so round one went to Jesus. Round two probably went to Jesus too. Round three. All right, we made it. We made it to the the banger, all right? Look at verse number 11. The third story just kind of takes the cake on all of them. It gets all the love. He says, "And and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now, I, I know we want to go forward because we know the story. This is the story that we have lovingly called the prodigal son. A story that uh, Charles said, Dickens said is the greatest short story ever told. Like, uh, this story is, is like, powerful, right? Um, I think a more, more accurate title would be the story of the prodigal sons. And I actually think probably a better title altogether would be the story of the forgiving father. Because that's where the emphasis is in Jesus' story. Um, but, but I want to take just a few moments because this story is, is powerful. This story is a good story. And we can get a lot out of it just by a surface level reading, right? Just by, just by scratching the surface, we can walk away being inspired, being challenged, and possibly even being convicted, right? But I've learned that it's when I take a step back from my culture and perspective, and I take a step into their culture and perspective, to the people who were actually there that day listening to the story. It's when, I, it's when I sit in their sandals, right, that the story becomes not just good, but, but transformative. Like, like, this story has the power to change your life this morning. And that's what I'm after. I'm after life change. I don't, I don't just want you leaving feeling good. I want you leaving changed by the text. And I think that's what the story can do. So, so the worldview that Jesus is talking about here is a patriarchal worldview. You've probably heard online that we're smashing the patriarchy. Yes, we are. Okay. But listen, th- th- this is what they're talking about. They're talking about this patriarchal worldview that, uh, that the man is in charge, that the, the patriarch is the man, right? He's the dude, okay? And so you got one dude, and it's not that the matriarch didn't have a part in their culture. The matriarch was vitally important in their culture. But the, but the patriarch, all the responsibility, all the weight, and all the work fell on his shoulders, and it was, div- it was divvied up amongst his children. And when his children would go out and, and they would get married, well, if they were going to do that process, they would then have the, the whole dowry where they would seek the hand of her marriage, and then they would go away. So their engagement period, they didn't spend together. It was spent with the man building on to his father's house. Build it on. He would build on space in his father's house. And when that room was done, he would then go and get his bride. They would have this massive party, a massive celebration, a massive ceremony. And then they would come back and they would live in that room that he had built onto the house. And he would work for the father. He he would fulfill a lot of the same roles that he fulfilled before he was married, but now with a family of his own. And, and that was kind of the way their culture worked. So, so really, as, as you can picture this, as, as the family expounded, as, as it kind of continued to grow, this became this massive house. It became known as a, it was their, their batav. It was this, this family compound unit, if you want to think about it that way, where everybody worked and lived and, and had their responsibility handed down to them from the father. Well, the questions began to arise. What happens when the father dies, Right. Like, what happens? What happens to all this legacy and all this work and all this responsibility? Well, it would be divided amongst his sons, his living sons. Unfortunately, not his daughters, but his sons, okay? And so the the sons would get his inheritance. They would get not just his wealth, but they would get his work and his responsibility and his legacy. And so in this case, the guy's got two sons, And so he would divide his spoils, everything that he owned, all of his work, all of his responsibility, into three different parts. You say, that doesn't make any sense. Shouldn't it be two parts? He's got two sons. Yes, that would make sense. But they would divide it into three parts because the older son, he's known as the Behor, he's going to get the double portion. So he gets a double portion of blessing, but he also gets a double portion of work and responsibility and all that is included with that. Like now he is the one that's going to be kind of, you know, the patriarch, so to speak. Okay, 
So all that to say that when we have in this story a younger son, not, not, not the elder one, the younger one comes to his father while he's still living and he says, give me the portion of goods. He doesn't say inheritance here. He says, I just want the good stuff. Just give me the money and the wealth that comes to me when you're dead and I'll be happy, you know. Um, all of a sudden it makes sense why Jesus didn't ask this story in the form of a question, right? Right? Like the first one was like, uh, if you were a shepherd and you lost a sheep, wouldn't you go find it? Yeah, absolutely. If you were a woman who lost your wedding ring, wouldn't, wouldn't you go find it? Yeah, absolutely. And if you were a father who had a son that wished you dead and asked for his money, wouldn't, wouldn't you just give it to him? No, I don't think so. No, sounds like a horrible idea. <laughs> no, in fact, uh, you know, that's why it's so strange to me that the verse just ends by saying, and he divided unto them his living. Like Jesus so just casually is like, and so he gave him what he wanted. And everyone in the audience is sitting there going, that sure seems like a silly thing to do. Like, this is grounds for disownment. This is grounds for death. Like, you, you were welcome to leave the family, but you're not taking anything with you. In fact, if this would have happened, if this story actually played out, um, this kid would have been disowned, he would have been kicked out, and then they would have marked him dead. They, they would have had a funeral for him. They would have marked his grave. And then they would have uh, sat Shiva for seven days of mourning. And then they would have got on with their life. They would have gone back to life as it was. And he'd have a grave there marking his death. So, so as Jesus tells the story, it's almost like he's just ignoring cultural norms at this point. And then what Jesus does next is he's going to make you utterly hate this kid. And he does a great job with it. Like, Jesus knows how to tell a story, and he knows how to create a villain in the minds of his audience. So look what he says in verse 13. It says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. I don't want to get into the whole far country reference, but what it, what it, what it, what it was was an a obvious reference in their day to the Decapolis. So the Decapolis was a region on the other side of the Sea of Galilee that was Gentile and pagan. And uh, the Sea of Galilee is not very large. It's seven miles wide, 12 miles uh, long, I believe. And so you can see to the other side from where you're at in Galilee. And you could see across it, and you could probably see the, the smoke from pagan temples coming across. And so, like, in the, in, 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 the, um, in the Pharisees' mindset, it was forbidden to go to, it was forbidden to talk about. You didn't even utter the name Decapolis. And so they started referring to it as the other side of the sea or the far distant country or, you know, over there. And so Jesus is obviously saying, you know, he takes his living, he goes to the you know where, right? And he wasted on riotous living. Everyone goes like, of course that's where he went. Of course this kid, that's exactly where this kid would go. That's exactly what he would do because there's nothing good going on in the Decapolis. And then it says, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And his audience says, good. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. Unbelievable. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Okay, you don't have to like know all about their culture to know this, right? Like Jewish people do not like what? Pigs, man. They don't like pork. It's not that they don't like it. They probably love it, but they're just forbidden to eat it, right? Okay, because I've had pork. And it's pretty darn good. Okay, so like, uh, but they, they just can't have it, right? And so, so like it's an unclean animal. And so like, like think about it. What a perfect place for this unclean kid to end up with the unclean animals. Like this is exactly where his fate should be. And you can almost just feel like the Pharisees are sitting in the back going, okay, good. There's still justice in the world. You know, like this kid got what he deserved, right? Okay, and then Jesus twists the knife in deeper. And he goes, and he would have feigned to have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave to him. So Jesus is painting this like very grotesque picture where this dude is sitting in a pig pen feeding slime, feeding slob to the pigs and going, that looks really good. I would love to eat that right now. And no man would give to him. Nobody would give him any food. No one would give him any help. No one felt any pity for him. And everyone's like, good. I'm so glad that nobody feels pity for this kid because he's terrible. This is a terrible kid. But then he has this come to God moment, right? This come to his senses moment where he, he comes to himself in the next verse. And he says, um, how many servants, how many hired servants, my fathers, have bread enough and to spare? And yet I'm sitting here on this pig pen, starving to death, you know? You're like, man, none of the servants in my father's kingdom had any, 
any sense of longing for food. They were well taken care of. So he goes, I, I know what I'm going to do. I will arise and I will go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, man, I have sinned against heaven and against earth, right? I am no more worthy to be called your son. Don't really care about that. What I want you to do is just make me one of your hired servants. That way I've got bread to eat. That way I'm not sitting here starving. That, that way, you know, at least I'll have some food. So he, he devises this plan, right? And he, then he says, and then the Bible says, and so he arose. So now he's going to go fulfill this plan. He's now coming back to the Father. And we look at the story in our perspective and we're like, good on you, buddy. That's what you should be doing. Like, yes, this totally makes sense to us. Like, yes, he is, he's now recognized the, the, the pig pen of his life that he's in. And he's going to wake, he's going to go back to the Father. And like, we write the ending before it even comes, right? Because in our mind, we're like, of course the Father receives him. Of course there's gladness. This is the gospel after all. This is what Jesus does for us. And so we, we've got the ending already written. But the people listening to the story that day did not have that ending written. The people of the story that day are sitting there going, this kid does not know how life works. You don't go back. You do not go back to the father. This guy thinks he's going to have a meeting with his dad. His dad's not talking to him. His dad wants nothing to do with him. They've already marked his grave dead. And by the way, if he does come back, they're going to kill him. They're going to stone him. They're going to bury him. In fact, in archaeological digs in Israel on a batav, they have found graves outside of the wall of the batav with bodies in it that are not marked. And on the inside of the wall, they have found graves that are marked with no bodies in them. That's what's going on here. This is the brutal reality of the culture of Jesus' day. This kid's not getting the date with his dad. This kid's not being welcomed in as a servant. That's not how it works. That's not how life works. In fact, I can almost guarantee that the people sitting there listening to the story at the dinner table, the publicans and the sinners, they're sitting there going, I tried to go back. And I had to hightail it back down the road as stones were being thrown at me. Like, you don't go back. I tried to show up to Sabbath one day and I almost got my head taken off. Like, this is, that's not how this works. This, this guy thinks he's going to see the father. And that's what makes the next part of the story so beautiful. Because as he makes his way back home to the father, it says that when he was a far way off, his father saw him. What does that tell you? It tells you he was looking for him. He was looking for him. See, this is not a story about a father who loses his son. He's got no clue where he's at as he panics around, looks under the table, finally finds him. It's like, oh, relief. No, no, no. This is a story about a father who loses his son and he knows exactly where he's at. He knows exactly what kind of a mess he's gotten himself into. He knows exactly what kind of a life he's been living. And yet every day he wakes up and he plants himself on that rocker on the porch, looking out on that road to Decapolis, looking and looking longing and waiting and praying for his son to return home and as he waits and he waits and he waits and he gets up and he, he paces back and forth and he just keeps looking he just keeps longing he just keeps praying and he just keeps waiting and he sees a traveler coming one day and he thinks it might be him and you can almost see his excitement as he, he runs to get closer but it's not him it's just some merchant trying to sell him uh, air conditioner for his house or social security something you know uh, extend my car insurance I don't want any of that I don't even have a car and so he sits back down and he waits and he longs and he prays and his servants bring him food but he won't eat it and his wife tries to get him to come in and, and get some sleep it's getting cold and it's late but he he can't eat and he can't sleep all he can do is wait all he can do is long all he can do is hope for his son to come home one day and as he sees him that day a great way off before he even knew why he was coming home before he knew if he was sorry before he knew if he had learned his lesson no None of that mattered to the father. He sees his son and he says, I've got to go get that son. I've got to get him before they get him. I've got to get him before they start throwing stones. They've got, I've got to show him the compassion of the father. So he gets up, he's moved with compassion and he runs. That might not seem significant to you, but patriarchs in this day didn't run. If you want to know why, watch Pastor Joel run, okay? It's not pleasant, okay? Right? <laughs> When you get older, you just don't have much dignity when you run, 
Running around is a child sport. You watch my kid, he's always running. He's always moving, right? Like, they always run. When you get older, you slow down. You're dignified, you know? This guy doesn't care about his dignity. This guy doesn't care what other people think about him. This guy's willing to hike up his garment, and he's willing to take down off the streets. Why? Because he's got to get to his son. Why? He's got to show him compassion. You say, why does he have compassion on this kid? This kid's not worthy of his compassion. This kid's not worthy of his time. You know why he's full of compassion? Because that's his character. That's his nature. That, that's who he is. He breathes his lifeblood of forgiveness and compassion on his children. And so he sees him a great way off. He runs after him. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son starts going through the script, right? He's got the script in his mind. He starts going right through it. I have sinned against heaven and against earth. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. And as soon as he gets to that part, the father cuts him off. Remember, he's got a whole nother line about make me one of thy hired servants. He doesn't get to that. The father stops him in his place, almost as if he hears him say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And he goes, well, that ain't right. Because you don't earn sonship. You don't work your way to being a son. No, no, no. You're a son because that's who you are. You are my son. I have compassion on you because that's who you are. It's not something you worked for. It's not something you're worthy of. It's not something that you need to smell good because of. No, no, no. He says, you are my son. So what does he do? He says, well, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Bring forth a ring and put it on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. He's trying to get him to understand you're a son. He says, go and, and kill the fatted calf, right? Bring him the fatted calf, kill it. Let us eat and make merry. You know how many people can eat off a fatted calf? 200 to 300 people. They're having a block party tonight. The whole city's invited to have a, a, a celebration over this son, over, over, this, over this child who says, I'm not worthy, I'm not holy. Notice he doesn't say, well, let's get you in a shower real quick. He doesn't say, bring forth the hose and hose them down. No, no, no. He says, bring forth the best robe. And put, whose robe is the best robes in the house? The father's robe. Whose ring is he putting on his hand? That's the father's ring. That's the signet of the family. Shoes were reserved for family. They were reserved for sons, not slaves. This is restoration. This is the father saying, you are worthy, not because of who you are, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are and who I am. And so he says, bring forth the fatted calf and kill it and let us make merry. And I love this next line. Because this, my son, was dead. We had a funeral for him, but guess what? He's alive again. He was lost and he is found. I mean, can you imagine those servants running around in the neighborhood, knocking on the doors? Hey, remember Johnny? Yeah, yeah, we had a funeral for him. He's alive. Yeah, he's alive. We're having a party. Come eat some, come eat some calf, man. Come eat some cow. There's no bacon on it, but come eat some steak, man. It's good. It's good. He's alive. So they celebrate. And don't you just love how the story ends? And they all lived happily ever after. That's the next verse, right? No, no, it's not the next verse. And I don't know why, because I'm like, well, that would make sense. Because like, there's a pattern. There's a lost item. There's a found item. There's a party happening. There's a lost item. There's a found item. There's a party happening. There's a lost son. There's a found son. There's a party happening. They all live happily ever after. But Jesus says, now... Apparently he was long-winded too. He has like a whole nother point here he's going to make. That's his way of saying meanwhile, right? The elder son was in the field. And we're like, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. A certain man had two sons. So yeah, we got to know what happened to the elder son. So the elder son was in the field and he came and drew nigh unto the house and he heard music and dancing. Okay, so he, he hears there's a party going on. And so he calls one of his servants, right? And he asked, what meaneth these things? We are Baptist. We do not dance and have parties with the music. What is happening? No, no, that's not what he asked. He calls one of his servants and he asks, what meaneth these things? What's going on here? And the servant, right? The servant said unto him, well, thy brother is come. 
He's alive. And your father killed from the fatted calf because he received him safe and sound. Like, yeah, and he goes off on his way. So the elder brothers now become aware of the situation that's happened. And the Bible says, and he was angry. And he would not go in. So he is absent and angry from the party, refusing to enter in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Okay, this word entreated, it's interesting. And the Greek word, uh, the Greek word for this is, is paraclete. It's one of the most versatile words in the Greek language. I think it's translated 17 different ways in your Bible. It can be translated as encouraged, as edify, as comfort, as beseech, as beg. It's very versatile. It can be used for all sorts of different ways. But, but, the, but the, the parsing of the word means to come alongside of. To paraclete, to, to come alongside. It has this idea of wrapping your arm around somebody uh, when they are distressed to encourage them, when they are uh, 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 afraid to give them courage, when they are uh, uh, in, in the wrong to get them to do right. Like it has this meaning for all of this. And the reason that I find it so fascinating and significant, and significant to, that, that we find it here is that John uses this word to, um, well, he uses it in the noun form of parakletos to describe the work of the Holy Spirit that comes into the world. That's what Jesus uses it, that, that, that one day the parakletos will come, the Holy Spirit, the, the comforter is going to come. So, so when I see this, I say, okay, here is the father, and he's coming out to see his son to be the Holy Spirit in his life, to, to, to try to get him to be in the right direction, to try to be, uh, to comfort him, to beseech him, to beg him to, hey, you're, you're in the wrong. You need to come be a part of this party. You need to celebrate. And, and like, I just find it so fascinating that the father, just as willing as the father was to run out the front door to chase after the younger son. He is also just as willing to run out the back door and chase after the elder son. Right? See, see here's the problem. Both the sons are lost. Both the sons have no clue what it means to be a part of the family. Both the sons have no understanding of what it means to be loved and have compassion and be a part of the family that this father has. Both sons, one is lost in his unrighteousness, the other is lost in his self-righteousness, but they are both lost. And the father is just as concerned for the elder as he is for the younger and vice versa. He loves them both and he desperately wants them to know they are a part of a family. So he comes out of the house and he says, hey, what's going on, man? Why, why, why are you angry? Why, why, why aren't you in there? This is, what, this is our mission. We celebrate resurrections. And the, and the son answering him. In the next verse, said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid, that's a small goat, fills about 40, 60 people, that, my, that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon as this, watch this, he says, as soon as this thy son, he won't call him his brother, as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Okay, so like we are like a fly on the wall in this conversation that's happening, right? And like the father leaves the party. He's like, hey, what's going on? Why aren't you in there? Why aren't you partying? Like, look, come on, let's go. Let's go. No, I'm not coming in that party. Why would I go in there? I've been out here in the field working day after day after day, working in the field, sweating over your, over your gardens and sweating over all the responsibility I've got. I've been working my butt off for you week after week and year after year. And like, like I, have, I have my men and they're so faithful and, and like they obey all the rules and, and we never do anything wrong. We're always in bed by eight o'clock and out at the crack of dawn working the fields and we're always doing what you want us to do. We've never transgressed you. We've never broken any of your rules. And you have never once given us a little tiny goat to eat. Like, what a party this guy's throwing in his mind. You know, like, we just want a goat to sit around our table. No music, no dancing. We just want a goat to eat. Just give us a goat. And we'll call ourselves Baptist. And we'll have fun. We have fun. This is fun. If you're not having fun, leave. Give me a goat. I've worked all my life for a goat. And I've never gotten one. Never gotten a goat. But as soon, as soon as this little goody two-shoe, your little boy, your little son comes home and he's got the stench of the pigs all over him. He's been living with the harlots. He comes home, you're like, oh man, go kill, go get the fatted calf. Everybody get invited, a big party. Come on, come on, come on in. 
you come out here, oh, why aren't you, why are you outside? Why don't you want to come in? Because I don't want to. I'm out. And you're like, awkward. Didn't need to hear that, Jesus. What in the world? And the last two verses of Luke chapter 15, in my, in my mind, in my personal life, have become some of the most convicting verses in all of the scriptures. As this father looks at his son after the temper tantrum he gave, and he said unto him, Son, he calls him son. He reminds him who he is. He says, You're my son. Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. He says, listen, man, if if you want the goat and you want to celebrate with your friends, you can have it. You don't need my permission to have it. You don't need to earn it. You don't need to work for it. It's yours. You're my son. All that I've got is thine. Like, you know how this works, right? He took his share. Everything left is yours. You want a party? Have one. But listen, it was meat. It was necessary that we should, it was vitally important that we should make merry and be glad. For this, thy son, or for this, thy brother, oh man, I love that. He reminds him who his brother is. He says, for this, thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. He says, listen, if you want to go and you want to have a party, you can have it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You're, you're my son. But it was necessary. It was vitally important that we have this party tonight. It was vitally important that we invite the whole neighborhood to come. Why? Because your brother was dead and he's alive. He said, listen, listen, we are a family that celebrates resurrections. We're a family that's going to celebrate new life. We're a fa- we are not a family that's going to act like dead men don't live again. No, no, no. We are a family who is going to party at new life before our mix. When people come out of the grave, we celebrate. We get excited about it. We welcome them back with open arms. And so it is necessary that we have this party tonight. Why? Because a dead man is living and he just so happens to be your brother. So yeah. Yeah. We are having a party. And yeah, I am out here begging you to come in because that's what the heart of the Father is. We celebrate resurrections. All right, Luke 15 is over. Um, Jesus, little tip for you if you plan on preaching the sermon again. Leave out the elder brother part. It, it was kind of awkward. <laughs> kind of put a downer on the whole story. I was feeling like really good about the whole party going on and the music and, and then, you know, I don't know what that was. <laughs> let's just, let's just, you know, and maybe next time put that one back in the, the sermon notebook, you know, <laughs> let's just leave the elder brother part off. You know, why, why are you telling us the elder brother part? What can I tell you? He had to tell the elder brother part. He had to. And there's a reason why he had to. Because remember, Jesus is using these three stories from their text and their context to challenge and convict, and by the grace of God, trying to pursue the Pharisee and the scribe. So, so we saw how he used the Ezekiel 34 passage in the first story. We saw how he used their cultural representation of the wedding ring in the second story. And now in this third story, he's using the culture of their patriarch, but he's also using the history of their text in the story. Okay, so you've got a father who has two sons. So, so search your Bible trivia for a father who had two sons in the Old Testament and search and search specifically for one whose younger son was more blessed than the elder son who got his inheritance early, who ran off from the family and made a mess of his life. Can you think of anybody? You got father, two sons, and one of the sons, the younger son goes off and makes just a mess of his life. He has to work. 14 years for the girl he wants and he gets her sister too and he's got all these like we're talking about isaac's two sons jacob and esau okay jacob's the younger one he goes he makes a mess of his life 
But in Genesis 32, Jacob is kicked out of that side of the house too, and he is now working his way back home, a place he never should have left. And as he works his way back home, he encounters God. And he has a wrestling match with God where he gets new life. And man, God does a work in Jacob's heart. He's going to go back, and he's going to go back in Genesis 33. And guess who comes out to meet him in Genesis 33? Is it Isaac? No, no, no. In fact, turn there. Go, go to Genesis chapter 33. You got to see it. This is awesome. Maybe this is just like the Bible nerd in me, but this stuff just make like, I just like start geeking out when I see it, okay? So chapter 3, chapter 33, verse number 1. Hold your place in Luke 15. It says, And Jacob lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, Esau came. Yeah, Esau, the, the, the one that he, he, he took the blessing from. Esau came, the, the older brother. Esau, the, the, the one that was supposed to get all of the blessing, the one that was supposed to have all the favor. Esau came, and with him 400 men. Ooh. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And so you're like, what are you doing, Jacob? You're going to the back of the line, you know? Well, that was his plan in Genesis, 30, in Genesis 32 was to send all of them forward as like sacrificial lambs. And then Jacob was going to be like, do you forgive me? <laughs> but now watch what he does. After this encounter with God, it says in verse 3, and he passed over before them. And he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near unto his brother. Now this is his way of saying, I ascend. I'm not worthy. Please forgive me. And Esau, verse 4, this is the best. Esau ran to meet him. And he embraced him, and he fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Can I tell you, that is about as word perfect as you're going to get to what the father does to the son in Luke chapter 15. So like, I'm sorry, Charles Dickens, I know you think the story's great, but Jesus plagiarized it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if Jesus turned the story in, the teacher would be like, I think you stole something from this kid, you know? Like, no, no, this is what Jesus this is what Jesus does. This is what Jesus has always done. He takes stuff from their text and he tells it in a new way. And the changes he makes need to make us go, wait, wait, why did he change that? Right? Because in the in the original story, in the history, right, in the history book lesson, who is it that goes out and greets the brother as he returns home? It's the elder son that does that. It's Esau that does that. It's the elder brother that goes and receives his son. So if you're a Pharisee and you're a scribe sitting there listening to Jesus' story in Luke 15, and he gets to the part where the son's coming home, they're sitting there going, yeah, we know how this goes. We're supposed to be the ones that go out and greet him. We're the elder brothers. We're supposed to be the ones that are welcoming him back. And then Jesus goes, and so the father goes out to meet him. And they're like, Isaac? Isaac goes out to meet, Isaac's like a hundred years old. Why would Isaac go out to meet Jacob? That's not what Isaac does. That's what Esau does. And that's the point. Jesus is saying, yeah, yeah, guess what? I'm here because you stink, <laughs> because you're not doing your job. You're not being the Esau. Even Esau, even the hated Esau, even the, even the guy that started the Edomite nation who, was, who attacked Israel, even Esau knew that when Jacob comes home, you receive him with open arms and you bring compassion and love to him and you have mercy upon him. Why? Because that's what you do. That's the heart of God. That's what makes you different. You love those who don't deserve it. You have compassion on those who, who didn't think they could earn it. You, you show mercy to those who didn't think they would ever get it. You just love people. And you just hug them and you just embrace them and you kiss them even though they don't want you to. Because they just say, hey, listen, I know you smell like a pig and I know you got the filth of the world on you. But Jesus wants you at the party. So come on in because dead men live again because Jesus lives today. And so we celebrate resurrection. We celebrate new life. We celebrate parties. We have them. We even throw some music and dancing in every once in a while. Why? Because dead men live again. Whoa. Whoa, and don't you just love how the story ends? The elder brother sitting there listening to his dad. He just breaks down. He's like, oh, oh, dad. Oh, dad. Oh, dad. Oh, dad, I've been so selfish. Oh, dad. Come on, let's go party. 
Let's go get younger brother here. Come on. Oh, younger brother. Oh, younger brother. Oh, you're so much younger than me. So much. Oh, oh, yes. Man, let's take a family photo. Oh, man. And so then there's music and there's dancing. Yeah, and they party all night long. And they all lived happily ever after. Man, Luke 15 ends the way it's supposed to. Man. Is that how it ends? By the way, how does it end? Well, well, Jesus says it was meat. The Father says it was meat. That we should make Mary and be glad. For this, thy brother was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he was found. And then like the credits roll. Black screen, movie's over. And it's not a Marvel movie. There's not like a post credit scene at the end. Like it's just, it's just really over. It's, this is it. <laughs> There's no more. So like I'm left with a bunch of questions. I don't like cliffhangers, okay? Like what happened, Jesus? Like did the younger son really repent? Did he really mean it? Did he ever really learn what it meant to be a son? And like did the elder son ever like get that he was kind of like just like this really bad dude that no one liked? Like did he, did he get it? what about the father? Like, how did that work out? The father's got his two sons living, but he already split up all of his stuff. Like, how did that work in this culture? What happened? What happened? How did it end? We don't know. Jesus just finishes the story. He's like, my time's up. It's time to eat. <laughs> and he lets it linger. And I think that's the beauty of the Bible sometimes. But we look at the Bible and we're like, where's the answers? Where's the answer? How, how does it all play out? And Jesus says, no, no, no. Here's the story. And you got all these pieces. And you're like, how do I put that together? And we're meant to wrestle with it. And, and we're, meant to, we're meant to ponder it. And we're meant to think about it. And, and man, I think I've come to the conclusion that Jesus in this story says, you know what? You get to decide how it ends. You get to decide today how the story ends. That whenever you pick up and read this text, you get to decide the ending. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. I love my family. In my family, we have bacon, though. So, <laughs> I can picture Jesus saying those words. He is dead. He's alive. He was lost, and he is found. And then I can see Jesus sit down at that table. And take a piece of unleavened bread and hand it to Matthew, who was a publican, who had come to follow Jesus. And he takes that bread with Jesus' arm around. And I can picture Jesus taking a glass of water and passing it to Mary Magdalene, a sinner, who had come to follow Jesus. And then I can see Jesus look out through that door at the Pharisees and the scribes. And I can see him motion to the empty chairs at the table and say, you going to come in? Take a seat. We're parting. We'll forget it ever happened. Just come in and be a part of the family of God. Will you take that chair today? See, here's the thing. Our country, our world, divided. Like, we know that. We are more divided than we've ever been before. But zoom in. Because our churches are divided. Our churches are divided. Our, the church at large is more divided than it has ever been before. And here's the thing. I've been to a lot of churches. Like, that's, that's my job. I go around to different churches, and I love every church that I'm in. I tell you, sometimes you get to a church and it's just like, you can tell they're building their party. And their parties stink, man. Their parties are lame. They got their little goat and they got their little this and no one else, unless you want this and do this and have this, then you cannot be a part. And so like they're celebrating, but they're angry the whole time. It's like I've been to other churches and they've got their goat and it's totally different than that one. Totally different. Music's different. Their walls are green. 
They got, uh, <laughs> they got chairs instead of pew. Like, it's totally different, right? Hey, I'm not talking about you, but, but, but you know what I'm talking about. It's totally different than that, but it's still just a little goat, and it's still just for people like them. And it's really all the people that weren't invited to that party or, did, or got tired of that party, and they, so they came over here. And they're still just as angry as they party. But now there's dancing, and it's lame because none of them know how to dance. I'm telling you. Jesus is saying, listen, there's a bigger party. Heaven's bigger than your goat. Heaven's bigger than, 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 than your walls and your church. Heaven's bigger than what box you want to put this in and what category you want to put this in and how you want to practice this. Heaven's bigger than that. Heaven's a party where everyone's invited. The publicans, the sinners, the Pharisees, and the scribes. Everyone's welcomed. And by the way, we're going to find out the demon-possessed dudes, they're welcome too. They're all welcomed. Everybody's welcomed. Even the pagan Gentiles, they're welcome. Even the Americans, they're welcome. Everyone can sit at the table with Jesus and eat. Why? Because he died on a cross for you and for me. And he rose again. Why? So that you might rise again. So that your dead and cold life can be invigorated with the Holy Spirit. So that you might have life and life more abundantly. Hey, how's the abundant goat you're eating? Come eat the fatted calf. Come eat at the table with Jesus. Our mission here on this earth is to go light the pathways, to go look for the sheep, to go out and search for the coins, to go out and be looking and waiting for the sons coming home. Why? Because we're a family that celebrates resurrections. We're a family that believes dead men can live again. Why? Because our whole faith is built on a dead man who lives. And so we celebrate. And so Luke 15 has a message for the people there that day. But Luke 15 has a message for us today. It has a message for you and has a message for me. Come sit at the table. And this story is not about are you a prodigal or are you an elder brother? Are you a Pharisee, a scribe? Are you a publican? Are you... No, no, no. This story is about whatever you are. You, you have an invitation to become more like the Father. The invitation in this story is to become more like the Father, who in his love, mercy, and gentleness searches for the lost sheep, coins, and sons. Father, we thank you this morning. You're a good God. 